First, I want to echo many of the comments made by Abdi. Um, I'm honestly very privileged to be here today, even more privileged to follow up both Banafsha and Abdi, both whom I have tremendous respectful, uh, respect for and tremendous respect for this organization as well. I, I'm honestly honored. Uh, what I want to talk about very, very briefly in, in the short eight to ten minutes that I have is the unintended consequences of what I think Abdi alluded to, which are these bilateral tensions between the Iranian government and the U.S. government, and how those unintended consequences have affected the Iranian community residing in the United States. There's two general observations I want to make first. Um, some of this many of us already know about, but I think are worth discussing anyway. First is that the Iranian community that resides in the United States is very much a new community. That is to say, sociological studies have basically demonstrated that the majority of Iranians who currently are in the United States immigrated here in the 1970s, uh, then again in the late 1970s, and then once more through the 1980s and 90s. Uh, the vast majority of them came for economic or educational opportunities or to seek asylum as a result of political persecution in Iran. What this fact uh, implies is that the vast majority of Iranians continue to have connections with individuals back in Iran. In fact, studies have indicated that at least 60 percent of Iranians who continue to remain in the United States have family members that are still in Iran. So that's one important point I want to first discuss, which is that there's still a deep and genuine connection between the Iranian community here and the community in, in their native land, which is in Iran. The second general comment I want to make is that since the 1980s, that is almost parallel to the increased immigration to the United States, there has been more strict and more severe sanctions placed against the Iranian government by the government in the United States. Uh, the first round of sanctions occurred in the 1980s under the Carter administration in response to the hostage crisis. Since then, almost every single presidential administration be it Reagan, the two Bush administrations, Clinton, and even recently uh, with Obama, have instituted their own round of sanctions, making it such that the permissibility of any type of relationship, be it economic or non-economic, between Iran and the United States has narrowed significantly to the point in which it's almost impossible now to transact anything between the two co uh, the countries without some sort of permission from the Department of Treasury or the Department of State. So these two general observations create a tension within the Iranian community that I don't think is replicated for other minority communities. In other words, most minority communities are either not newly immigrated to the United States or have come from countries which maintain some sort of relationship with the U.S. so that all relationships are not banned. So this unique tension between these uh, two countries has created a circumstance by which Iranians, as I think Abdi correctly pointed out, are now caught in the middle. Now, there's two types of predicaments, uh, which, again, I, I think are unintended consequences of our current bilateral tensions between the U.S. and Iran, which I think are important to highlight, and which I think Banafsha alluded to as well, are important in the sense that they require both policy advocacy and legal representation. The first of these issues are matters that relate to export control. Uh, so just to put a broad brush on this, many of you uh, should probably know that for the most part, all goods and services that come from Iran or go to Iran are banned under the current sanctions regime. Most people believe this classifies to the sale or the export or import of commercial goods, but it doesn't. It goes significantly beyond that. It goes to all goods, services, or transfer of assets. This is incredibly important, and, and let me highlight it again. The current sanctions regime applies to all export and import of good services or financial transactions. This means if my mother is sending any goods or services to me from Iran, they can potentially be subject to the sanctions regime. This also means that if I am donating anything to someone in Iran, it could be subject to the current sanctions regime. And the sanctions re regime is set up in such a way that such violations could subject me or my mother or anybody to both civil and criminal penalties. So the law is broad. The net is incredibly wide. But more importantly, 
both the Department of Justice and the Office of Foreign Assets Control, which is the division of the Department of Treasury, which enforces sanctioned regulations, has demonstrated that it is not only willing, but also <laughs> is going to prosecute these non-commercial types of claims. In other words, the transfer doesn't need to benefit the Iranian government. The transfer doesn't even need to benefit Iran's nuclear infrastructure in any indirect way. It is only necessary that it violates the sanctions regime to kick it up to a point in which the U.S. government will prosecute these claims. We have seen uh, these types of situations and I think two relevant cases which I'll, I'll, I'll highlight for you right now. Uh, some of you may or may not be familiar with a nonprofit organization in Oregon called the Child Foundation. The Child Foundation is a nonprofit organization which was established in order to assist individuals here, help underprivileged children in Iran who might not have family to support them, so that people can donate money to these children, support them through their education in, in junior high or high school, all the way to, to a, a college degree, when they may have never been able to have that support from their family members in Iran. The Child Foundation donated millions of dollars to underprivileged children in Iran to support them to do precisely these types of things. Recently, however, because these donations were done without a license from the Office of Foreign Assets Control, they, were, they fell under, the in, uh, under an investigation by the Department of Treasury and were forced to settle with, for a civil fine. Not including the following. The founder and CEO of the Child Foundation later had to plead guilty to charges that he defrauded the U.S. government and conspired to violate U.S. sanctions law, and he's currently facing two years in jail. Not only that, but two of the principal donors to the Child Foundation are currently in court being prosecuted for precisely the same thing. That is, for donating money to the Child Foundation and conspiring with the Child Foundation to violate the U.S. sanctions regime. So not only do we have risks for the individuals who are transferring the funds, we have risks for the individuals who donated to these nonprofits so that, for all intents and purposes, to commit to a charitable cause. So that's the first example. The second example uh, some of you, again, may be familiar with, and I'm, I'm sorry for preaching to the choir, is the Mahmoud Banki case. Uh, Mr. Banki, for those of you who don't know, was an undergraduate student who actually studied at UC Berkeley. He then later went on to get his PhD degree from Princeton. And he became a very, very successful young uh, professional in, in the field of consulting and marketing and so on. He was also very good to his family. His mother was in the process of getting a divorce in Iran. His concern was that his mother's assets would be subject to Iran's uh, divorce laws. And so he wanted to assist her in order to transfer those assets from accounts in Iran to the United States where they would be safe from Iran's marital laws and therefore he can secure her marital assets. But he did so without a license. He was picked up by the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, by the U.S. Marshal's Office, excuse me, which is the enforcement body of the U.S. Department of Justice, which uh, does these matters. He was, he was put into detention, and he was put to trial, and before a jury, he was found guilty uh, to two years imprisonment for violating the sanctions regime. I want to note a couple of important things about the Bonke case. One, the former director of OFAC wrote a letter in his support saying, first, we never anticipated these types of transfers to be violations of OFAC, but second, we believe that the vast majority of the Iranian-American community is engaging in precisely these types of transactions. But nonetheless, despite this concern, the jury found him guilty. Second, Mr. Banki was not spending money in order to support the Iranian government. In fact, the judge made a finding that none of the transfers in which Mr. Banki engaged in did anything to support the Iranian government or Iran's nuclear program. But yet, the jury still found him guilty. These two cases, I think, highlight the types of risks that Iranians face as a result of these bilateral tensions between the Iranian government and the U.S. government, which although might be unintended, are certainly real and genuine for those who currently reside in the United States. The second issue, and it's the immigration issue, and I'll, I'll briefly touch upon it, is that because of these bilateral tensions, there are numerous immigration issues for Iranians who have, who have also come to the United States. One I want to touch upon briefly is the single entry, po single entry policy that the U.S. government currently has. Uh, for those of you who not, are not familiar with immigration law, immigration law dictates that uh, 
our country will provide multi-entry or single entry rights to individuals who are seeking entrance to the United States depending upon how that country treats our nationals. So for the first time, we mimic the Iranian government. So how the Iranian government treats American citizens is how the American government will treat Iranian citizens for purposes of determining whether they should receive single entry or multi-entry visas. So clearly the Iranian government does not have good relations with U.S. citizens. Clearly they have restrictive immigration laws when it comes to uh, Americans, and so does the American government vis-a-vis -vis Iranians who come. So currently we have numerous individuals of Iranian origin who have come to the United States who can only get single entry visas and therefore are forced to stay in the United States for the duration of their studies, for the duration of their work, without having any right to go back and visit their families. More importantly, and I think this is something to touch upon, is that if they ever do leave the United States, because they only receive a single entry, they risk never being able to return. This, re this risk is very, very real. In fact, I spoke to a friend of mine about two days ago who had indicated that he was studying at UC Davis. He was two years in. He wanted to go visit his brother in Norway. He could not return to Iran because he was part of the military there, disobeyed orders. He did not kill Kurdish individuals, even though he was obeyed to, was forced to flee, came to the United States, studied, then went to visit his brother in Norway. I'm sorry, the story was kind of convoluted there. And when he reached Norway and went to the consul's office to seek re-entry, he was denied. They said, we're not going to allow you to return to the United States because I have a policy of not allowing Iranians to get visas to come to the United States, and that's just the way it is. So he's stuck in Norway with no way to go home, i.e., no way to go back to Iran where he would be subject to the death penalty, and now no way to go back to the country in which he was doing his studies in. So these, these concerns are, are very, very real.